This is Jeff Deist, and you're listening to the Human Action Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back once again to the Human Action Podcast. Uh, so happy to be joined by our great friend and Mises.org contributor, Daniel Lacaye from Madrid this Friday afternoon for him. Now, you might recall a couple years ago, we had him on the show to talk about his book, Escape from the Central Bank Trap. Now, some of the numbers involved have changed dramatically just since two years ago. And more recently, I guess it was actually May of last year after the COVID crisis started to unfold, we had a great live webinar with Daniel, which received a lot of great attention. People really felt like they got some actionable knowledge out of that. And so I wanted to have him back on the show because he has a new 2020 book called Freedom or Equality. And I think a lot of the themes that Daniel discusses and presents in this book are not only of interest to us as as people who want to understand sound economics generally, but more importantly as to what's going on uh, in, unfortunately, this dismal state of affairs we find ourselves. Uh, And Daniel, you you know how you can tell if a book is really good? It's got a little. It's got a little paragraph by J- this guy Jeff Deist here. So, so <laughs> that, that's that means the book is great. But you know, I just it, I touched on your book from I believe 2018, Escape from the Central Bank Trap. So I want to go back and say, you know, uh, the the amount of new debt at the sovereign level, but also at the corporate and personal level, that's been created worldwide uh, since you wrote that book, and of course accelerated by COVID last year. It, it, it's it's almost staggering. Absolutely, it is. Yes. I think that one of the most dangerous uh, elements about the last two years, and we have to underline and and, and, uh, remember that the massive debt acceleration did not uh, happen only because of COVID-19. It was already very aggressive in 2019. Um, One of the biggest uh, dangers of it is that uh, the world and the economic discourse and uh, um, uh, debate in political terms is always revolving around governments as being the lenders of first resort instead of the lenders of last resort. And now almost in any debate that, that you get uh, that you see uh, in in the media or that you get in 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 the economics world revolves around the idea that governments and central banks are the only and first solution, not just a way of uh, uh, trying to balance or, or 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 reduce or mitigate the the impacts of a of a of a slowdown in the economy or a change in the economic cycle. So I think that that is the biggest worry to me about the situation. We're hearing it right now, the how the World Economic Forum and central banks are saying that even if the the economy recovers, governments and central banks need to continue to uh, wrongly called incentivize demand. No, and, and, and I think that this is a very, very dangerous precedent relative to other other periods of the of the of, of history. No? So the theme, one of the themes in your central bank trap book. Uh, were that there are limits to what central banks can do. In other words, they can create lots and lots of new debt, and it produces only a tiny amount of, let's say, new GDP. So are are we now up against a a situation where, (laughs) I mean, these guys are just, they're they're literally pushing on a string where there's not much more they can do, and at some point these governments are going to have to face the music Oh, they are. We, we're still we're starting to see it now. For example, despite extremely dovish messages from Powell and from Miss Lagarde, um, we're seeing how bond yields are rising, creeping up. Uh, inflation expectations are going up. The the spreads between Germany and other eurozone countries are rising, even with the ECB purchasing a hundred percent of net issuances. So. We we are we are seeing the evidence of that uh, uh, diminishing return of monetary policy. Once you realize that um, uh, the first wave, which is that 
massive liquidity injections generate a certain level of euphoria in markets, markets elevate valuations and, and you get multiple expansion based uh, on the idea that the recovery is going to be much stronger, then the recovery is not much stronger. It is like all uh, recent recoveries in the past 50 years, weaker with less productivity growth and with less uh, improvement in, in, in real wages than the previous previous one and the the diminishing return of monetary policy is so evident that what you end up getting is is obviously secular stagnation which is where we were getting into already uh, between 2018 to 2019 and where we're going back to one thing that's really different about the crisis of what we might call the covid crisis which you and i would say was an existing financial crisis exacerbated by the virus uh, is that in the in the 08 and 09 crash, most of the action at the monetary policy level was in, in creating new commercial bank reserves, what we might call the monetary base or M0. Whereas this time around, it seems like both the US government and European governments have created a lot of fiscal side stimulus. So there's actually new M1 and M2 growth. There's actually what we call ready money. So that's from an inflation perspective, that's different than just creating new bank reserves, which by definition aren't let out. Absolutely. Uh, the, the previous, uh, this is one of the very important factors about understanding the subtle but very important differences of, of uh, the changes in monetary policy and their implications is that in QE1, what you were basically getting was probably a deflationary spiral. Why? Because what, what you were creating, as you said, were reserves for banks that would lend to an economy that was already in overcapacity. And therefore, by perpetuating overcapacity and by maintaining the level of indebtedness of the more uh, unstable sectors or the ones that are less efficient, what ended up happening was that there was no uh, real infl or, or at least evident in headline CPI uh, inflationary effect. Obviously, there is uh, significant inflationary pressure in non-replicable goods. Uh, I think that the difference was precisely last year, in which the decision to uh, inject liquidity directly to government spending and to uh, provide either checks or, or different levels of stimulus to households uh, elevated the level of M2 and M3. To, to, to figures that we would not even imagine a few years ago. Uh, M3 growth uh, came up uh, this week in the Eurozone, it was at 12.5%. This is China type of M3 growth. Huh? And um, obviously with all of the challenges that the Eurozone has. And that obviously is coming uh, to bite consumers with a much higher level of inflation, particularly in the goods and services that they buy on a daily basis. Uh, we see, for example, that despite an allegedly subdued level of inflation at the end of 2020, you had fresh food rising 4%, you had insurance rising 3%. So two, three times the level of headline CPI in, in Europe. The same happened in, in the United States. And we're now getting the, the double whammy, no? You have the, the, the bounce effect of the, of the commodity complex. Who would say that oil prices would be uh, recovering 30% in less than a month, no? And all those effects are uh, very, very uh, negatively affecting the least well-off of, uh, of society, yes. the poorest, which, uh, as, you, as, as you very well know, are the ones that suffer inflation the most because where they, the, the goods and services that they buy, they get all of the negatives on the, on the things that they buy on a daily day-to-day -day basis, and they don't get any of the positives on, the, uh, on things like technology, leisure, hotels, things like that. Yeah, it's interesting. I saw you tweet, I believe, just maybe today about grain going up in price and seeing inflation in grain. Where I live in Auburn, Alabama, there's a huge housing boom going on. Lum lumber. <laughs> you got to frame houses with wood. Lumber is up 100 percent over 12 wow. months, which is causing huge problems for the for the 
construction trades, the contractors, the home sellers, the developers, because you have so much uncertainty uh, with regard to pricing. Uh, so yeah. th this is this is something where I think we're we're going to have some huge dislocations ahead. And if you're the let's say the new Biden administration in the United States, where people are seeing it is gas and groceries. I mean that's yeah. that's pretty hard to hide. And, and I wonder if any of our uh, let's say central bank centric friends will ever give the Austrians any credit uh, for for warning about what that this is what central banks do. This is their raison d'etre. This is what they exist to do to inflate as a policy, and that you know we shouldn't be surprised by this. It's it's really, it, it's 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 hugely destructive. And, and you know you bring up the poorest, and and I want to I want to pivot a little bit to your book because there's so much in here, which is really about uh, poverty, and, yeah. and how we create a a more just and a more fair society. And and you use the term and and the concept of social capitalism in this book in a way that I think is intriguing and important. And I want to just let you explain it yourself, but I want to distinguish you, what, what you're talking about conceptually with the social elements of capitalism. Of course, Mises is almost named human action, social cooperation. Um, it is different from what we think of today or discuss as stakeholder theory or equity concepts. It's a different thing. Absolutely, it is. It is actually probably to a certain level, almost the opposite. Mm -hmm. Because what we what we are getting uh, from from the you know from the conversation in in different uh, international bodies and, and uh, with between economies etc is this idea of centralized planning and uh, uh, government intervention as the key factor to improve equality and to improve the welfare of, of people when what we're seeing actually is that more government intervention and more central bank intervention are precisely the pillars of the uh, rising inequality in recent years you know big, why because the biggest uh, beneficiaries of massive liquidity injections and huge government debt uh, increases are the first recipients of money which are the the indebted and the ones that have access to assets and who are the worse off the ones that that pay for that situation savers and uh, salaries real wages and the least well off so the, for only because of ideological reasons we find counterintuitive that the idea that less government intervention is actually more social and that is actually what i what i say in in the in the book is that if we really want to achieve better welfare and allow the lower to middle classes to recover sound money and lower government intervention are much more effective because what we're seeing right now is the opposite what we're seeing is that uh, the, the this this constant uh, aim at increasing inflation is reducing the disposable income and the capacity of the middle class of flourishing and uh, achieving uh, a better status. And at the same time, it's making the poor uh, less uh, available to climb the social ladder. And then mm, when uh, the issues of inequality come up, then they say that what they have to do is more. And what they have to do mm -hmm. is even more government intervention and even more, even more uh, central bank intervention. So the point that I make in the book is that is to recover the word social for true capitalism. Is to recover, is to is to rename, reclaim the the mm. word social to the uh, human action mm, component of capitalism that is precisely the constant uh, joining of the benefits of different types of uh, people and different interests for a common good that delivers the best level of welfare for everybody. That's what I'm trying to say is that at the is that what you need to do is obviously there's going to be some form of uh, uh, cooperation with the with the governments in each country, but governments cannot be the first 
and the uh, 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 and the uh, and the deciders of where innovation and uh, investment have to be in, because they will inevitably uh, be wrong by by definition for a very simple reason. Their incentive is to um, perpetuate the status quo. The only way in which you uh, achieve innovation and welfare and better uh, real wages is by allowing competition. The key factor in social capitalism is competition and innovation. Those two things cannot be directed from the government down, but from the civil society up. You know, our, our friends on the left, I think, have a lot of skepticism when it comes to the idea of the private sector making investments in, uh -huh. in social welfare, which is yeah. a lot, which is what this book is is chiefly about, and the, they also, I think, because they need central banks to pay for everything. Yeah, they they some of them recognize that central banks cause inequality, hmm. but they don't attack central banks root and branch. I think these are a couple of blind spots on the left. Yeah, absolutely. They they see that central they they like central bank intervention. When central bank intervention creates inequality, what they uh, demand is for central banks to directly finance government spending. And that's how they go from being uh, very much in favor of quantitative easing to uh, the concept of modern monetary theory, which is not modern or a theory. It's something that has been implemented uh, his, in history numerous times now, which is printing endlessly uh, to, uh, to finance government spending, isn't it? Um, I think that the problem in the left is that they perceive that the idea that a profit-based economy is going to generate more welfare than a, a debt-based economy for them is wrong because they believe that looking for a profit is in itself a bad idea until we understand what looking for a profit is. No, it's the is is aiming for efficiency. It's aiming for uh, achieving the way to deliver more goods and services that are affordable to the majority of people, and at the same time making them sustainable for the future. A profit-based society is a sustainable society. An unsustainable society is a loss-based economy that is predicated on debt. No, obviously for them, inflationary policies are not bad. Uh, they, they, because it's very simple. I come back to the point that the biggest beneficiary of massive liquidity injections and massive central bank uh, uh, policies are governments. So it's in effect, a way of expropriating wealth out of the economy in a way that you would not be able to achieve even with a communist revol revolution. No, the best way to expropriate the wealth and the uh, and the um, productive fabric of a society in favor of government is the destruction of the purchasing power of the currency. So, if you if your ultimate goal in the left is to achieve that, little by little. Those policies are something that you will defend. And obviously they know that it will create hyperinflation at some point if it's done in the way that it's done in Argentina or, or Venezuela, et cetera. Of course they know, but they know as well the reason why in those countries, the governments have not gone back to sound money is because it's a perfect way of expropriating uh, the wealth of the country via monetary policy and fiscal policy. Because think about this, modern monetary theory says, well, if we inject too much liquidity and we put and we issue too much money and then there is too much inflation, it is because it is not taxed enough. So what we need to do is use fiscal policy to tax that excess money out of the economy. Think about this. So what they're doing is say we issue money. The beneficiary is government. The ones that pay for it are real wages and salaries. And once inflation, which is a tax on the poor, uh, creeps up, what we do is tax the last recipients of money. 
real wages and save us. Huh? So that's very interesting. And, and obviously, you might think that it's a flawed concept, but it's not a flawed concept. It is a beautifully, perfectly uh, thought out concept. If what you want to do is expropriate the wealth of a nation. And that is socialism at the end of the day. No? That's why what we need to do is to remind people that a profit-based economy is not something that goes against the people. It is that something that goes in favor of people. And it, I, I had the other day, and sorry to, go, to, to get too long into this, I had the other day a, 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 an interview in El Salvador. In El Salvador, as you know, they um, uh, dollarized the economy when, the, when everything went completely pear-shaped and uh, inflation was through, through the roof, a disaster, etc. Now the, the government is sort of implying that there could be a possibility of de-dollarizing, no? And people were asking me, why is that a bad idea? No? And I said, think about this. What would you do with those uh, colonies, is the name of the currency, what, what would you do with those colonies, colonies the moment that you received your salary? Obviously, exchange it for gold, for dollars, for anything. Yes. Why? Because you know precisely that it's going to be completely destroyed, uh, the purchasing power of that currency. So I come back to the point, we need to remind people that expansionary monetary policies as an ultimate goal, don't aim for uh, mm, the, the idea of price stability and maintaining the purchasing power of the currency, but gradually expropriating part of the wealth of the economy to finance the debt and the spending of governments. So you actually have a chapter here that's all about uh, profit and price and how they're yeah. essential to this idea of, of social welfare and social benefit. And pr profit and price are awfully difficult to calculate sometimes when we've got an unsound currency underlying hmm. everything. And, and if, if lumber's going up 100% in 12 months, where I live, I'm not so sure we have much room to be criticizing uh, El Salvador. Yeah. <laughs> well, we have we have some room, huh? some room. Some room. Yes, we have some, some room. room. Well, it's one thing, you know, I always, every time that uh that you know, all of us in in Europe or in the United States criticize rightly the monetary policy of our nations, I always uh, remind my good friends in Argentina that uh, they suffer uh, four or five percent monthly inflation due to due to wow. a much uh, worse uh, monetary policy. Monetary policy can get a lot worse. But I agree with you that it's gotten out of hand. Hmm? I agree with you that it's gotten out of hand. And there's things like this, but not just lumber or thing because this is the this is what i what i hate about the the dialogue with uh, the ones that defend inflationary policies is how um how intellectually dishonest it is now you you're saying look you know uh the rent prices uh health care education insurance uh, so many of the essential fresh food the, of the essential goods and services that people purchase are rising much faster than in headline inflation and that uh, and then real wages you should be uh, truly concerned about monetary policy but what do they do they never blame it on monetary policy so they will say that the reason why lumber prices are up is not because of the dollar debasement, which obviously is a big, big, big component of it, but because there's ample demand for reconstruction and um, refurbishment of properties in the area. And this is, uh, I come back to the, the perverse incentive of monetary uh, inflationism is to always blame an external enemy. In Argentina, the government destroys the currency every year. Prices go up 40%. What does the government do? Present itself as the solution with safe prices that are intervened. What happens then? That <laughs> the supply of those goods and services collapses because the, uh, the businesses have to sell them at a price at which they are losing money uh, before they sell them. And then who they blame? They blame the businesses. 
And you, you know the, the history of the assignats, for example, in France. In France, uh, they issued assignats. Inflation went through the roof. Who did they blame? First the church, then businesses. So it's the use of the external enemy. We're seeing it right now. No? First, they say that there's no inflation, so they print more. Once they print more and then inflation starts to creep up, then they say that it's temporary and that it has base effects. And it's, so they have to look at a longer period of time. Then some of the most important goods and services continue to rise above real wages and above the purchasing power of uh, uh, citizens in the middle and the lower classes. So they say that it's because of speculation. It's never the central bank or the government who's to blame. And that is, unfortunately, the perverse incentive of these policies is that when is that they will never give us credit and they will never give us credit because all of the negative effects that come from monetary policy, they will adhere the blame to somebody else. If bonds and equities go through the roof, the blame is not on central bank policy. It's on us investors who are greedy and evil and take too much risk. If uh, quantitative easing leads to mass to increased uh, inflation, they will blame it on businesses. They will blame it on OPEC. They will blame it on, you name it, on China. I don't know. You always have an external enemy. And that is what's, uh, what is so intellectually dishonest. And, and the, unfortunately, the reason why the left always continues to defend those policies, even with the uh, experience of it failing in Chile, in Argentina, in Iran, in Venezuela, so many countries, uh, Ecuador, El Salvador, you name it, um, is because they always say this time is different. And the reason why it happened the previous time is because of some external enemy. You know, it strikes me, we spent so much time talking about politics and monetary policy as though we can engineer or tweak or set a policy, but we never talk about just goods and services. I mean, this is Absolutely. what your book is talking about. We need productivity, we need innovation, we need profit signals for, for more goods and services. We, we, you know, this can't be engineered or commanded. It, it just strikes me that, for instance, money, what we, you know, money's gotten so funny. Now you take Bill Gates. Yeah. Bill Gates has a lot more zeros in his bank account than I do. But yeah. at the end of the day, our lives are far more similar than, than they were between a middle-class guy and a wealthy guy two, 300 years ago. I oh, mean, that, that's, gonna... that's because of deflation, innovation. I have a smartphone in my pocket that's roughly the same as Bill Gates. Maybe he has a nicer house or a nicer car or, you know, whatever. But our lives are more alike than unlike. Mm -hmm. And I think that's because of deflation, which seems like the shibboleth that mm -hmm. central bankers fight all day long. Absolutely. It's, that there is a massive welfare case for moderate deflation. Absolutely there is deflationary pressures lead uh, business owners and entrepreneurs to look for better alternatives, for more effective uh, uh, costing, for better management of inventories, for to invest in those technologies that, in, that make things easier and that make things more available to a wider public. Deflation is, there's absolutely nothing negative about deflation uh, when you include the words productivity, competitiveness, and efficiency. Absolutely. There is, there's only one, th think about this, in the periods in which we have had very high levels of inflation, what we have basically seen is a complete collapse in innovation, productivity, and competitiveness. Why? Because inflation is not a tool for competitiveness. Inflation is a tool for cronyism. What you're basically doing is a subsidy on the least uh, competitive businesses that are usually very close to the government and, are, are, and that are unable to improve either the wages of the, uh, of the uh, workers or the cost structure and the margin base of the business. That's why it is so important to, to, to tell citizens that this completely flawed idea that deflation is negative and inflation is good 
actually is proven by what they do on a daily basis as citizens. It's proven by the fact that you want to live in countries where deflationary pressures are allowing you to align your uh, uh, level of welfare to that of somebody as astronomically rich as Bill Gates, because uh, you have a similar access to goods and services. In an inflationary economy, the equivalent of Bill Gates would basically be some, I don't know, farm owner or, uh, or somebody who has the, the mm, concession of a uh, mineral resource. That's the, that, that would be the person. What would align you to that person? Absolutely nothing. What aligns you to uh, me, to Bill Gates, is this. Is that this uh, device is extremely cheap is extreme, or extremely cheap for everything that it contains. It might be expensive relatively, but if you think about it, what the, the, the evidence of the positives of uh, deflation are precisely in technology. And that and technology uh, innovation is actually uh, deterred by inflationary pressures. So that's the, the point that we need to make people understand is that uh, the, the message that we need to combat deflation, create some inflation, because then with that level of inflation, people will consume more, save less, uh, companies will uh, accelerate their investment programs that will create a beautiful incentive to improve real wages above the level in which prices go up. That is an absolute fallacy. It never, it's just never happens. It absolutely never happens. The real wages never follow the inflationary pressure because the inflationary pressure is a subsidy on the sectors that prevent real wages from growing. And that's why productivity growth, which is the first derivative of real wages, that's why productivity growth collapses with massive inflationary uh, policies. Well, you know, we can't separate any of this stuff from society or culture. I mean, it's all interconnected and it makes us, I would argue that inflation and a policy of inflation makes us worse people, uh, yeah. high, t high time preference people. But I want to give this quote, you're going to get yourself in trouble. I think this is actually from the, the introduction of the book. You say family is the most social economic agent. Be Absolutely. careful, Daniel. Next, <laughs> next thing you're going to bring up God or something. You're going to get in trouble. With, you're going to get in trouble with this book. But, but just, I, I mean, we're just about out of time, but I want to talk about the cultural ramifications of all this. So give us your thoughts. Yeah, when I say family is the most social economic agent, it's for people to understand that whatever your family is, uh, is that when individuals, free individuals get together for a common purpose, they willingly decide to help the, uh, the other part of that economic agency uh, without any problem, why? Based on a profit-based view. That is that you're using the uh, part of your savings and part of your, uh, of your wealth to create something that is better for everyone in that segment, okay? That's the, the point that I'm trying to make is that a society that is based on those similar principles, which are uh, prudent savings and a prudent investment is much more social than one based on spending at any cost and debt. Well, Daniel, I want to thank you so much for your time this afternoon. You know, ladies and gentlemen, you can find his book, Freedom or Equality, his book on the central bank trap and all of his other books at his Amazon page. Probably the best way to follow Daniel is via his website, which is dlacalle.com. There's both an English and Spanish language uh, site there. He also has both an English and Spanish language YouTube page. Uh, you can find his Twitter feed and other things through dlacaye.com. And in terms of economists out there sort of in the trenches providing analysis of real data, not over here in the academic or theoretical world, uh, there's nobody I recommend more highly to stay engaged with than Daniel. And so, hey, Daniel, I want to want to thank you for your time today. I uh, hope our listeners have a great weekend. The Human Action Podcast is available on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, and on Mises.org. 
Subscribe to get new episodes every week and find more content like this on Mises.org.